Welcome to the third module of a three-part series on parent-centered planning for parents with disabilities. This is part three, the parent-centered planning brief intervention. My name is Elizabeth Lightfoot and I'm a professor at the School of Social Work at the University of Minnesota. This module series is hosted by the Center for Advanced Studies in Child Welfare, which is also at the School of Social Work at the University of Minnesota. I would like to acknowledge two of my other funders of my research related to this module series. First, the National Institute on Disability, Independent Living and Rehabilitation Research, which has funded my research on parent-centered planning through the National Research Center for Parents with Disabilities at Brandeis University. Second, the Minnesota Agricultural Experiment Station, which has funded a number of my studies related to parents with disabilities in the child welfare system. So this is the third of a three-part module series. The first module was on the current state of the research on working with parents with disabilities. The second introduced parent-centered planning and its roots in person-centered planning. And this module focuses specifically on the parent-centered planning brief intervention. In this module, I'll talk about parent-centered planning, and I'll also use a case example to try to illustrate how the parent-centered planning model works. So first, to review from module two, the parent-centered planning intervention was designed to fill the unmet need of a supportive intervention that focuses on increasing the supports for parents with disabilities. And this is to complement the other types of promising practices that have research support for parents with disabilities that focus either on developing parenting skills or providing social support to parents with disabilities. And the goal of the parent-centered planning intervention is working on increasing parental supports as well as helping parents with disabilities with goal setting to receive the types of supports they need. The parent-centered planning intervention is strengths-based and it's person-centered. So what we did is we modified the person-centered planning approach, which was developed by Jack Beerpont, John O'Brien, and other colleagues that focus on the goals of the person with a disability and focusing on goal setting and breaking down goals into attainable action steps. And we modified this to focus directly on parents or parenting. So to review the key facets of parent-centered planning are that the parent with a disability is at the center of the planning and decision-making of the process. And the parent with a disability could also um, be joined with their child or their partner as being at the center of planning and decision-making. And other supported people are invited to participate to provide input and guidance, but not to direct the nature of the goals. The goals should be centered around what the parent with the disability and his child think are the most important in their dreams. So structured exercises that focus on the strengths and preferences of the parent. And there's a trained social worker who facilitates the intervention and monitors goal achievement in partnership with the parent with the disability. The parent-centered planning intervention involves four stages, and I'll go through each of these in more detail. But first, there's the intake meeting where information is gathered and key support people are identified. Then there's the planning of the parent-centered planning meeting where the meeting's scheduled and decide which participants are going to be invited and where it's going to be. Then there's the parent-centered planning meeting. And finally, there's follow-up meetings. And I'll go through each of these in a little more detail. First is the intake meeting. The parent-centered planning intervention involves an intake meeting where the parent with disability meets with the facilitator to gather more information about what their ideas are for participating in this planning process, to gather information particularly about who their key support people are for parenting so that we know who to invite to participate in the parent-centered planning process. Second is the planning for the parent-centered planning meeting. So we're at gathering information, identifying key support people, which we did a little bit during the intake meeting, and then identifying a comfortable location for where this could take place. This could either be in the parent's home or in one of their relatives' homes or in some other comfortable location where it makes the parent feel like a comfortable place to have these types of discussions. And then deciding who's going to make the invitations to people. Sometimes the parent with disability can make the invitations or wants to make the invitations themselves. 
or the facilitator can make invitations. And there's also discussions to be made about whether their child or children should participate or not. So some parent-centered planning meetings have the child there, maybe the child is a baby or young. Other times, these meetings happen without the children present. And that's really something that the parent with a disability and his or her partner and the facilitator can discuss amongst themselves. There's also questions about how involved the partner is in the process, too. If there's a co-parent or a partner of the parent with a disability who's not a co-parent, how they're involved in the process. All of this gets worked out in the planning, and then the invitations are made to the parent-centered planning meeting. As discussed in the last model, the parent-centered planning meeting is inspired by the PATH model, which is covered in detail in module two. But this is the structure for the parent-centered planning meeting. So first, the facilitator leads the participants through a exercise where they're thinking about the dreams of the future of the parent with the disability, who is the focus person of this intervention. And again, this should be the parent with disabilities dreams, not what other people's ideas for what their dreams should be. Next involves identifying parent strengths. So what are the strengths the parent has, particularly related to parenting? Now, these don't have to be exactly related to parenting, but they can be tangentially related to parenting, such as having lots of energy. That's a great strength that can lead to good parenting outcomes. And the next step is to make positive and possible parenting goals for one year. So what are the positive and possible parenting goals that build on the parent's strengths that they can make in the next year? So these are achievable goals. The next step is identifying the gaps and needs related to parenting. So what does the parent with disabilities need to reach these positive and possible parenting goals? The next step is to think of strategies to help reach these positive and possible parenting goals and thinking of people to enlist or enroll to assist the parent in making these steps towards reaching these positive and possible goals. This is followed by the development of short-term goals. These are goals that the parent could make in the next three to six months. And finally, the meeting ends with what we call bold steps and next steps. So the one bold step the parent can make towards meeting the strategies, towards meeting the positive and possible parenting goals. And this is a bold step they can make in the next two weeks and then thinking about what the next steps afterwards are. And this parent-centered planning meeting can last for a few hours and goes through a series of exercise where the facilitator is recording all of this information on a poster board that's hung up on a wall so that everybody can make reference to it. After the parent-centered planning meeting, and this differs from traditional person-centered planning, is then there's a series of follow-up meetings. So if this is a brief intervention as how we designed it for the National Research Center for Parents with Disabilities, these follow-up meetings should be regularly for at least six months. And then there needs to be plans developed for sustainability beyond this brief intervention. So is the plan then transferred over to a disability service worker, a disability support worker, or is this taken up by an advocacy organization or one of the supportive people of the parent with disability? As part of long-term services, so parent-centered planning could be done by a agency that's providing services. So then as in typical person-centered planning, you would revisit this plan yearly. But what's different in these follow-up meetings in parent-centered planning is because we found that parents with disabilities typically had pretty small networks and weren't as connected to services and supports as they felt they needed, that they needed a little more help in getting connected to services and helping them refine their goals and shift their goals and getting or in reaching these goals. So we had the trained facilitator work in this role for three months after the project, helping the parent with disability 
make these steps towards their goals. But again, in all instances, the parent with disability was responsible for taking the steps, not the facilitator. So I'll provide an example of someone. And of course, this is not a real example. The details have been changed. The name has been changed. These photos are not photos of the person that I'm talking about. I'll tell you the case example of someone named Jenny. So Jenny is a 26-year-old mother of a three-year-old daughter named Mickey. Jenny is diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder and has a mild intellectual disability as well as major depressive disorder. And at the intake meeting, Jenny identified several supports for parenting in place within her family. So Jenny and her daughter Mickey lived with her parents and her parents reported feeling overwhelmed and sort of even burdened by the situation as they were doing most of the primary caretaking for Mickey. And they were feeling a little frustrated by Jenny's reliance on them for primary parental support. The key support people that Jenny identified and who ended up participating at the Parent Center Planning meeting were Jenny, Jenny's boyfriend, who was also the father of the child, and he was also diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder and a mild intellectual disability, and Jenny's parents, who she lived with, and a maternal aunt who was close with Jenny and her family. And this was a sample goal plan from Jenny's parent-centered planning meeting. And so this meeting happened in Jenny's house where she lived with her parents in the living room, and Mickey was present at the meeting. And so you could see Jenny's dreams that she shared and brainstormed during the parent center planning meeting was for her to move out into her own apartment and have a car. For Mickey, she had a goal that Mickey was a little delayed in her language. So Jenny's goal was for Mickey to pick up on her language skills and to do well in schools, including having good friends and feeling included in her school and to be active and developing. The positive and possible goals, which are goals for one year out, were that Mickey would be in daycare or preschool. She currently was not. And that Jenny would be in school or training to prepare herself for work. Another positive and possible goal was for Jenny to learn how to cook. And this was something that her mom thought was a great goal as well. Jenny was involved in DBT and was going to complete her DBT. And she was also going to get involved in meal planning and grocery shopping related to her goal to learn and cook. So these were her positive and possible one year out goals. And these are all related to the dreams that she had. So the dreams for her to get her own apartment and her car would involve her having training to get work or school for her to take steps to learn to cook so she could take care of Jenny better and to complete her DBT. So then the meeting went back to the now. So she was currently not working and she was participating in DBT. There was no child care right now. And so the grandma was providing much of the child care and was feeling overwhelmed. Jenny had a lot of strengths and gifts. So Jenny is very organized. She's very punctual. She has good social and people skills. She's good at keeping a schedule. She makes the appointments. And she's good with technology and her phone and with apps. So she's very up to date on all of those. And so when at the parent-centered planning meeting, there was the sessions of what Jenny needed to build, what sorts of things did she need to work on. So they brainstormed that she needed training, perhaps to do a job assessment to complete her DBT. Related to childcare, they thought that Jenny needed to get childcare assistance and learn more about preschool options for Mickey. And for the grandma feeling overwhelmed, they needed free time or downtime for her mother, who we're calling Ruth here. So then when you're thinking about who to enroll or enlist or who to reach out to to get support for this, some of the ideas were vocational rehabilitation, for Jenny to talk to an early childhood special education worker, and for everyone to work on their boundaries. The short-term goals for Jenny were to have a monthly calendar that had some balance in it, to complete DBT in the next four months, and to have preschool or childcare for the fall. So these are short-term goals that were in the next three to six months for Jenny. 
And then they left the meeting with some bold steps for what Jenny would do in the next week or two. And it was for Jenny to create a weekly schedule that included grandma's time off. So where she would take care of Mickey for at least one night a week or maybe more. And that she would build the chores into the schedule to start learning how to live on her own and also to give some balance in the family. And for Jenny to make the appointments to talk with job assessment and childcare options. So this is the idea of what a sample goal plan would look like related to parent-centered planning. It was all related to Jenny's role in parenting Mickey, and it focused on Jenny's ideas and dreams for herself and her daughter, but her also her family was coming into play too, but it was centered directly on Jenny's parenting. In the follow-up meetings with Jenny that were held afterwards, clearer boundaries were established between Jenny and her mother. And she needed a little help with assessing community support. So the facilitator helped her with that, but community supports were accessed to help Jenny increase her skills, such as independent living skills, pay Jenny's mom for her caregiving as a PCA, and to enroll Mickey in a preschool program. And after six months, Jenny and her boyfriend were no longer together, though he was still active in Mickey's life. Jenny had completed her DBT program and had just secured a part-time job, which was in her goals. Both Jenny and her mother reported continuation of their improved relationship that they had worked out in this parent-centered planning meeting. So this is a case example of how parent-centered planning meeting could work as a brief intervention. So when we're thinking about the, the implications of parent-centered planning, it does show promise as an intervention for improving supports for parents for adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities and other types of disabilities, and can also assist with parents in attaining their goals. Social workers and other direct service professionals can use these parent-centered planning process to support and enhance the parenting of parents with disabilities. We did find when we did our intervention study that many parents had very limited parenting support and these support networks were fragile. We saw this in the example of Jenny, where she was no longer with the father of Mickey during the parent-centered planning process. We found that with similar people who participated in our process that actually their social support networks were very fragile. But we did find that people made positive outcomes and were making steps towards improving their parenting and towards reaching their goals for parenting. We also found that the trained social worker actually made a difference. We found that in our trials of parent-centered planning that the licensed social worker, who was also very well-versed as a disability advocate and had a personal family member with a disability, and was a trained therapist, was really good at understanding issues facing parents with disabilities and the child welfare system, and was knowledgeable about connecting parents with disabilities with resources. So we think that that's an ideal situation where we can have the facilitator of this process also be very well-versed in talking with people with disabilities and providing disability supports, as well as having a broad perspective of what type of resources are out there both for parenting and for supporting people with disabilities. We think the parent-centered planning model fits very well with the social model of disability, as well as the concept of individual supports that are supported by the American Association for Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities, but it broadens it to focus more realistically on the idea that people with disabilities also are members of families, and that's an important family role for them. It also fits well with the person in the environment paradigm of social work, where we're focusing on not just trying to fix the person or the parent with disability themselves, but rather to think about the broader context and how we can bring the broader supports in to help a parent with disability. And our idea is that no parent is parenting by themselves, that all parents are parenting in social support context of some aspects of nature. And finally, we think parent-centered planning fits within the general trends in child welfare, such as family group conferencing or alternative response. Parent-centered planning also 
rests on person-centered planning, which is obviously very well known among disability advocates and service providers. And so this would be something that could be easily adopted in the field of disability services or by people working in child welfare who could collaborate with folks in disability services or disability advocates who are familiar with person-centered planning. So this is the end of our three-part module series on parent-centered planning. And as I mentioned several times, we have a number of resources available on the main page of this module series, including our parent-centered planning manual, where you have in-depth step-by-step instructions on how to implement parent-centered planning, as well as other resources, such as a bibliography that lists all of the resources that we mentioned in this module series, as well as links to research related to parents with disabilities and links to person-centered planning as well as practice notes we've already created, as well as a podcast on parent-centered planning we already created. We hope that you have found this module series to be helpful and hope that maybe you will consider implementing parent-centered planning in your work with people with disabilities or recommending it to others who might be interested in looking for new ways to support parents with disabilities. Thank you.